Hello, and thank you for joining the POCUS Academy for today's POCUS Bytes webinar. I'm Maddie, and I'm the facilitator for today's webinar. We are now starting, so all lines have been muted. Please use the chat box for any questions or comments that you have throughout the webinar. I would like to invite you to our next webinar, which will be on July 9th, where, we'll, we, where we will be discussing the use of point-of-care ultrasound for nerve blocks. Register today by going to www.pocus.org to save your spot. Our speaker today is Dr. Lorenzo. He's a consultant in sports and exercise medicine. After finishing his orthopedic residency in Australia, he completed a four-year full-time specialist sports medicine training program with the Australian College of Sports Physicians. He currently works in private practice at the Institute of Sports Exercise and Health in central London, and he's worked as a specialist sports doctor in various elite sporting environments, including WASP Rugby, Melbourne Storm Rugby League, and Fulham Football Club, and he was a senior sports doctor for Tennis Australia. His interests include POCUS, ultrasound-guided injections, and the management of tendinopathy. He has a passion for teaching ultrasound-guided injections and has developed an online e-learning course in collaboration with Sano Skills and 123 Sonography, which will be released in mid-July. So stay tuned for that course. Thank you, Lorenzo, for being with us today. Thanks, Madeline. And I appreciate uh, the invite uh, and asking me to speak today at this fantastic POCUS webinar. Uh, I, it is a pleasure to be involved in such a fantastic e-learning webinar, particularly on the use of ultrasound to guide injection therapy in MSK medicine. What I thought I'd do today, I've got about 15 or 20 minutes, I thought I'd briefly discuss why uh, a clinician like myself or other clinicians, practitioners, physiotherapists uh, would use ultrasound for injection therapy. I want to discuss briefly the evidence uh, for the use of ultrasound in injections, and then give an example of how we approach teaching ultrasound-guided injections. And I'm going to be using the example of the trochanteric bursa uh, and how we approach this injection. And then at the final uh, few minutes, I'll have a video that will outline uh, this injection as we show it on the e-learning course. So as many of your viewers know, ultrasound is increasingly being used uh, by clinicians to assist in the diagnosis and management of MSK conditions. But there's also an increasing evidence that ultrasound could be used for injection interventions uh, in different areas. And the clinicians often see this as a valuable tool uh, for use of uh, ultrasound Sorry, I can't get this up yet, uh, for uh, using ultrasound for both diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. Traditionally, what clinicians uh, would do, and certainly I've done this myself when learning MSK injections, we would use landmark injections. And this is an example of a glenohumeral joint injection. And this is taught from coming from behind and infiltrating into the uh, joint. Uh, and we would often infiltrate cortisone and now regenerative um, substances such as PRP, uh, bone marrow aspirate and stem cell injections. However, there is increasing evidence that landmark guided injections have reduced accuracy and this may then lead to reduced, effective, reduced effectiveness. Uh, in addition, it can also lead to potential side effects if you're injecting substances out, outside the desired target as well as being less uh, useful as a diagnostic tool. More clinicians are recognising the uh, value of ultrasound-guided injections, particularly when using substances such as cortisone and now uh, regenerative uh, interventions such as PRP, stem cells and bone marrow aspirate. In addition, ultrasound guidance also provides a practitioner with a valuable tool to perform more advanced techniques. This is an example of aspiration of a Baker's cyst using ultrasound guidance. It's very difficult to perform this injection without the use of ultrasound guidance. And also dry needling or fenestration of tendons in tendon pathology. This is an example of dry needling of 
a tennis elbow. I was recently attended a conference in Spain on sonosurgery and their practitioners are using ultrasound guidance for such advanced procedures like percutaneous carpal tunnel release, percutaneous A1 pulley release, uh, fasciotomies and Achilles and patella tendon scrapings. So it is important to consider that ultrasound is not only useful for the diagnostic purposes for the clinician, but also can be used in therapy. And that can also, as a result of using ultrasound, can be both diagnostic and uh, therapeutic, uh, which can help uh, patient and their clinical management. So I want to briefly discuss some of the terminology that we use when looking at ultrasound and ultrasound guided injections. We use the term axial view to describe the relationship of the transducer to the particular anatomy. So in this example, we're scanning the long head of the biceps tendon, and we can see here the biceps tendon is scanned in the axial view, uh, and to the right uh, is the lesser trochanter, uh, lesser tuberosity, and to the left is the greater tuberosity. Uh, the image below is the longitudinal view of the biceps tendon. Uh, this is distally and scanning up to proximal. We also describe injections as being in plane or out of plane, and that describes the relationship of the needle to the transducer. So an in plane injection is where the needle is parallel to the transducer so that you see the whole of the needle in the imaging view. Alternatively, an outer plane view is where the needle is perpendicular to the transducer. So what you see on the image is a plane dot. And we tend to use these different types of injections for different anatomies and different pathologies. So in this example here, this is a scan of the patella tendon. What we're doing here is a longitudinal view of the patella tendon and an in-plane injection. So this injection will be described as longitudinal in-plane injection. Conversely, this injection would be described as axial, so you're getting an axial view of the patella tendon and an outer-plane injection. So the injection would be an axial outer-plane injection. In most cases, particularly for beginners and those that have just started using ultrasound, we would teach the in-plane approach. Uh, and here this is an example of an in-plane approach to a hip joint injection where the needle is parallel to the transducer. And as one develops um, skills associated with using ultrasound and ultrasound guided injections, you then move on to the more difficult outer plane injections. So I often get asked the question, well what is the evidence to suggest that ultrasound guided uh, injections are superior to say landmark guided injections or fluoroscopic guided injections. Well, this uh, uh, is a position statement by the American Medical Associ Association for Sports Medicine and they released this uh, statement about three years ago. And it seems that their evidence is trending certainly towards the use of ultrasound guided uh, or, or ultrasound guidance for injection therapy. There's certainly extensive evidence to suggest that there is increased accuracy. There is moderate evidence to suggest uh, ultrasound guided injections are more effective. And there is preliminary evidence to suggest it's cost effective. One of the systematic reviews that they looked at in their study was this paper here, which was an ultrasound guided shoulder girdle injection uh, and it was a systematic review and meta-analysis of the studies performed comparing ultrasound guidance uh, with landmark guidance. And they found that there was indefinite, imp unequivocally improved accuracy of ultrasound guidance compared to landmark guidance in glenohumeral joint injections, in acromioclavicular joint injections, and also in long head of biceps tendon sheath injections. In addition, there are a number of studies that have shown greater effectiveness when using ultrasound compared to landmark guided injections. These were a series of studies performed 
uh, in inflammatory arthropathy patients that had knee joint injections. Uh, there was uh, significant reduced procedure pain. There was a reduction in pain scores and improvement in therapeutic activity of cortisone in patients with inflammatory arthritis who had an ultrasound guided injection compared to those that had landmark guided injections. And finally, this is a systematic review on the cost effectiveness comparing ultrasound guided injections uh, with fluoroscopic guided injections. And there seems to be a uh, reduction in costs associated with using ultrasound guided injections compared to fluoroscopic guided injections, although the accuracy seems to be the same. So in summary, significant evidence for improved accuracy, moderate evidence for improved effectiveness, and preliminary evidence for cost effectiveness of using ultrasound compared to landmark guided or fluoroscopic guided injections. So I'm gonna give you an example of how we teach ultrasound guided injections. Uh, this is a trochanteric bursal injection. Uh, certainly, I tend to use these injections for patients that present with lateral hip pain, also known as greater trochanteric pain syndrome or gluteus medius tendinopathy. As a clinician, I see a lot of these cases, particularly in middle-aged females who uh, want to be active, and they often present with intractable lateral hip pain. My first port of call, of course, is referring them on for phys physical therapy to perform a progressive loading program. But as most cold practitioners know, a sizable minority of these patients do not improve uh, with physical therapy, and we need to look at other possible treatment options for these patients. One of the treatment options I instigate is shockwave therapy. There's some low level, lower level evidence for use of shockwave therapy uh, in greater trochanteric pain syndrome but I also consider trochanteric bursal injections. So the indications for trochanteric bursal injections are a plateauing or a failure of improvement with rehab. And so the indications include trochanteric bursitis or gluteus medius tendinopathy with tendinosis, calcification, and or a partial tear. So the way you visualize uh, the trochanteric bursa is with the patient sideline, uh, with the probe in the axial position. On ultrasound, what we tend to see is the greater trochanter. And you can see here on in the yellow outline is the anterior facet of the greater trochanter containing the attachment of this structure here, which is the gluteus minimus tendon. Then you also have the lateral uh, and posterior facet here, which contains the attachment of the gluteus medius tendon. And above that is the trochanteric bursa. And so here we have the trochanteric bursa, which is in the interface between the gluteus medius and minimus tendons uh, and the tensor fasciolata and gluteus maximus um, uh, posteriorly. And we approach this tendon usually posterior to anterior. So in these patients, we often use a longer needle. Again, it depends on the body habitus, but generally I tend to use a 22 gauge, 3.5 inch needle, or potentially a small needle in those patients that are slimmer. I use a combination of local anesthetic and corticosteroid. I tend to use either dipamidrol or triamcinolone, approximately 20 to 40 milligrams uh, of cortisone and two to three mils of local anesthetic. If you're looking at PRP injections, then I would be looking at injecting approximately two to four mils of PRP directly into the pathology. So in this case, if you're looking at PRP injections, you'd be injecting into the uh, tendinosis. Whereas a cortisone injection, you want to inject uh, around the tendon or within the trochanteric bursa. So in trochanteric bursal injection, I tend to use a linear transducer for those that are slimmer, but you need to consider a lower frequency curvilinear probe for those patients with a higher body mass index um, due to the increased sound pe uh, penetration, which will, then, which will then lead to improved needle visibility. And so the position that we place patients usually is usually sideline, 
uh, their knees and hips slightly bent. Uh, patients are facing the ultrasound scan. The clinician will stand behind the patient and opposite the ultrasound scan. There are two injections we can perform. We can perform the axial injection or axial approach. So the transducer is played in the, placed in the axial position and the needle is in plane. We enter the uh, skin through the posterior aspect and then, then passes through to enter the greater trochanteric bursa, which is superficial to the gluteus minimus and medius tendons. We also have the longitudinal approach. The patient is in the same position. The transducer is placed longitudinal to the tendon and the needle is in plane. So I'm going to show a video now of that procedure. I'll be describing the procedure and uh, the video will last about two minutes. And this is typical of what we, what we have on our e-learning course where we have uh, a description of the, uh, of the, or the theory, description of the theory, and then a video following that description. This case is a 61-year-old personal assistant who presents with a 12-month history of left lateral hip pain resistant to physical therapy. Clinical assessment demonstrated features of gluteus medius tendinopathy. Given her persistent symptoms, she agreed to an ultrasound-guided cortisone injection into the trochanteric bursa to allow her to progress to rehabilitation. Note the ultrasound images revealing intact gluteus minimus and medius tendons. The patient is placed in a side-lying position with the left side upwards. The clinician stands behind the patient facing the ultrasound machine. The probe is placed in an axial position to visualise the gluteus minimus and medius tendons. Note that we are using a curvilinear probe to improve visualisation of the tendons. The needle enters the skin about four centimetres deep to the probe, moving lateral to medial. The target is a trochanteric bursa between the iliotibial band tract and the gluteus medius tendon. You can see the injectant tracking medially and laterally in this interface as shown. Great, that was, uh, so that's an example of uh, a trochanteric bursal injection. We've actually done that for uh, every other body part. So we're looking at the hip, the knee, the ankle, and then the upper limb, the shoulder, the elbow, and the hand and wrist. Uh, and we're actually releasing uh, that e-learning um, uh, program uh, or MSK ultrasound guided injections e-learning program in about two weeks. So quite excited by this. In addition to that, what we're looking at doing is um, also uh, doing a practical course to coincide uh, with this e-learning course and that will be performed in various uh, centres around the world. We're looking at North America, uh, Europe, uh, Asia, and also the Pacific, so it's quite exciting. So in summary, I just want to give you a taste of, of uh, what we're doing with ultrasound and ultrasound guided injections uh, to uh, emphasize that it's a very effective tool for practitioners, not only for diagnosis, and also, but also for therapy. We're using it to um, guide interventions there is increasing evidence of use, not only in accuracy, but also uh, in effectiveness and cost effectiveness. Uh, but it's a difficult skill and it requires uh, lots of practice uh, in, in, uh, in, in becoming skilled at producing, uh, at performing these injections. So we might move on to the questions. Thank you, Lorenzo. That was absolutely wonderful and very informative. We did get a couple of questions in during the webinar. 
The first question that has come in, and, and if you have any, I guess I should say for the audience, if you have any additional questions, you can continue to submit those. We will do our best to get through as many as we can during this time. Um, and if we don't get to your questions throughout this portion of the webinar, then we will uh, be able to email respond to you as well. So the first question that has come in is, how does MSK ultrasound help physiotherapists better service their patients? I mean, I think um, I found a very uh, effective tool, not only to help with the clinical assessment, so I tend to use it uh, as a point of care tool after a history and examination or subjective and, and objective examination. I tend to use it to either support my clinical assessment or potentially move me on to other, other um, differential diagnoses. So it can help with diagnosis, but it also can help with, as I described here, with uh, injection intervention or interventions that practitioners can use. I know in, in the UK, and certainly the UK physiotherapists are, um, uh, have made significant inroads in, in, in their ability to use ultrasound both for diagnosis and in, in intervention. And it provides, uh, more importantly, a one-stop shop for patients that come in uh, with a musculoskeletal condition and, and the, the point of care ultrasound can be used as part of that one-stop shop, both for diagnosis and interventions. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have questions rolling in. So the next question that has come in is actually, um, sorry, it's a bit in pieces. Uh, can we inject in Throcanter out of plane versus in plane? Okay, so, so the question is, can you do an out of plane injection? So you can do an out of plane injection for any joint or soft tissue. The problem with an out of plane is that you don't know exactly where the tip of the needle is. And this is the difficulty in in performing out of plane injections and certainly i would advise for someone starting out with uh, ultrasound guided injections of, of joints and soft tissue is that you start with the in plane view initially and then as you develop skills you can then move to out of plane injections there are some advantages with out of plane injections but certainly it's a little bit more difficult uh, and i would advise to start with in plane um, and, and before proceeding to out of plan injection. Thank you. Uh, the next question that has come in is plantar fasciitis injection is uh, injected superficial or deep or within fascia? Mm, that's a very good question. Uh, so it depends on what you're injecting. So plantar fascia, if you're injecting cortisone, I would strongly advise not to inject into the fascia. I would advise to inject around the fascia. And my preference is not to inject near the fat pad, which is superficial. So the target of the plantar fascia injection tends to be deeper uh, or deep to the plantar fascia. And I tend to use an in-plane axial view. I want to avoid the fat pad if, if at all possible. The other thing that I've found with plantar fascia injections is that they tend to be pretty painful and injections generally and I, I try and use um, or I uh, advise patients uh, that they should have a tibial nerve block uh, before the injection uh, and, and that's something that I would perform five to ten minutes before uh, the uh, procedure of the plantar fascia injection and that gives a nice block and that then allows me to target my intervention um, uh, without that uh, significant pain perception. Thank you. I'm actually going to try to attempt to combine two questions mm -hmm. into one for you. Um, so the questions are, could you discuss complications surrounding um, MSK ultrasound guided injections and what mm -hmm. is the failure rate of non-ultrasound guided MSK injections? Okay, so, so there's two parts of that question. So the complications of uh, ultrasound guided injections and I presume that's compared to landmark guided injections. So when you're doing ultrasound guided injections there's always the concern that because you have a machine and a probe 
and you're introducing other instruments that potentially could have contamination. So I've, certainly when I started injections uh, nearly 12 years ago, um, I was concerned that maybe, uh, you know, there could be an increased risk of infection rate as a result of using ultrasound guided injections. I haven't seen that in the literature and certainly, you know, looking at all the evidence, there doesn't seem to be an increased infection rate when using ultrasound guided uh, injections. Um, the other part of that question was uh, the accuracy of landmark guided injections. So that really varies according to the type of joint you're injecting. So if you're injecting, for example, a glenohumeral joint, the accuracy of uh, a landmark guided injection is approximately, and this is according to the studies, approximately 50% versus a knee joint or an AC joint, which tends to be uh, about 80%, um, sometimes a bit higher, 85%. Now, that still means that with a knee joint injection, one out of five of your knee joint injections are probably not going into the joint. And I think if it's not going to the joint, uh, then potentially it might be um, less effective, particularly if you're using regenerative techniques. So I think that uh, you need to consider that versus ultrasound guided injections, which tend to be close to 100%. Thank you, Lorenzo. Um, another question that has come in is, could you please tell us a little bit about the ultrasound guided sacroiliac joint injections? Mm. <laughs> I just did one of these on a, on a course on the weekend. So there's a bit of controversy about uh, sacroiliac joint injections and also spinal injections. I certainly, um, I have colleagues that do spinal injections under ultrasound, they do facet joint injections and nerve root sheath injections. I don't personally, but I do use um, ultrasound guided injections, uh, ultrasound guidance for doing sacroiliac joint injections. Um, I think uh, I tend not to do too many of these because I think the the diagnosis of, of sacroiliac joint pain can be quite challenging. Um, my target for ultrasound guided injections is the inferior pillar of the sacroiliac joint between the ileum and the sacrum. And that's the target for me. And, and you can often see this uh, facet quite clearly uh, on ultrasound scan. So I tend to target that facet. I do an in-plane axial approach, either medial to lateral or lateral to medial. Uh, and if you look at the evidence, it's probably a little bit less accurate than uh, thoroscopic guided uh, injections, but tends to sit at around 80, 85%. Thank you. Another question that has come in is, what is your preferred frequency setting for guided injections of gluteus medius? Again, that really depends on the patient. So if I have a thin patient, then, uh, you know, I, I would be looking at a high frequency and certainly using a linear probe. Um, so, uh, you know, you'd be sitting at above 10. Uh, if, you're, if you're using high frequency, then your um, the, the visibility of the probe um, is improved and certainly, um, uh, so I would, I would prefer in, in, in younger, in, in uh, as slimmer patients to use a high frequency. However, um, I have some patients that have a high body mass index. And so in those cases, I would tend to be using a lower frequency and that would sort of be below 10 um, and certainly looking at a curvilinear probe in those cases. So it really depends on the patient and, uh, and, and their body mass index. Thank you. Sort of along the same lines, are there any basic requirements of a portable ultrasound scanning machine in order to practice MSK interventions? Uh, so the answer is uh, not really. I mean, I think if you get a reasonably good uh, portable ultrasound machine, some great machines now, uh, there's a you know, great machine produced by uh, GE, um, some really good portable machines produced by Sonosite. Um, and all you need is a, a reasonably good machine and, you know, even just one or two probes um, can really start you off with, with um, uh, you know, most uh, ultrasound uh, or MSK cases. So I'd be looking at getting a, a linear probe and then um, also a hockey stick. And you might look at also uh, a curvy linear probe for the larger um, joints, such as the shoulder and the hip joint. But generally speaking, you can cover most uh, um, joints and soft tissue with two probes. 
and a reasonably good portable ultrasound machine. I would recommend looking at um, you know, those, those companies, GE, uh, Sonosite, uh, and there are a few other fantastic portable machines. Along the same lines, do you have any specific types of needles or brands that work better during ultrasound for visual visualization during an ultrasound guided injection? Okay, I, I, I don't. Uh, I know that there are certain needles that will improve visualization. They tend to be a bit more expensive. I think if you're starting out, you might want to look at getting these needles that improve visualization. But as a general rule, I don't. The general principle is the bigger the needle, the greater the likelihood or the improved visualization of the needle. So, you know, if you're learning or starting to learn how to, how to do ultrasound, I would generally start with a slightly uh, bigger needle. Um, and, and then as, as you get more skilled in learning the technique, then I would be moving to uh, a thinner needle, um, uh, again, depending on, upon the, the patient and the type of injection. Thank you. Last question for our group today. How useful is a hands-on workshop following e-learnings when it comes to ultrasound-guided injections? Look, I think, you know, I mean, this is a practical skill, and I think you can do uh, e-learning e to, to learn the theory, uh, but what you need is hands-on treatment. I think it's absolutely imperative if you're learning ultrasound that you get mentoring on how to do the, the ultrasound guidance. And I think this is one of the strengths of, of, of this teaching course is that we combine the two together. So the online learning uh, with the practical course. And I think it's almost imperative. I teach on a lot of ultrasound courses in London. And what we tend to do is combine the two together in a weekend course. But I find it overloads uh, people or practitioners because they need to learn both and they need to learn the theory and also need to learn the practical practical component. So we're hoping that if we can combine the two e-learning theory combined with the practical component, uh, practitioners can get the most out of uh, that practical aspect um, prior to, or obviously learning the theory prior to attending the practical component. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lorenzo. We really appreciate you being here today. A recording of this webinar will be made available on our POCUS.org website. For more POCUS talks, check out our podcasts, our blog posts, and of course, follow us on social media where we post regular clinical challenges. Thank you for attending our webinar today, and we look forward to having all of you join us on our next webinar, July 9th.